and like labeled it with like ISIS like conspiracy plot or something. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. Um, so So the plan for today is to uh, get more into what we are talking about on Friday with the Buckingham Pi Theorem and Dimensional Analysis. So I gave you some motivation on Friday remember, by saying that if we come up with a, a problem, right, some, some hydrodynamic phenomena that we can say is a function of some number of variables, then by intelligently manipulating those variables, we can actually reduce the total number of variables involved in whatever relationship we're looking at, so that it's more easily determined through experiments. Um, so today we're going to go through it's, uh, something of a cookbook formula for do performing dimensional analysis using what's called the repeating variable method. Uh, after lecture today, the plan is I have the, the Rosenblatt room books uh, for uh, I think an hour after lecture, you guys to bring any uh, questions from the review problems that I posted. Uh, the solutions to the review problems have also been posted up on Canvas, so you guys have access to those. And my plan is today to sit down and try to get all of the, uh, the, the homeworks that you turned down on Friday graded. Um, so that I could get those back to you, like you could pick them up tomorrow, if you want. But in case that doesn't happen, the solutions for that homework are also online, so you can at least see what the correct uh, answers to all the problems on that are. Uh, all right, so getting into this. The Buckingham Pi Theorem. So remember, the, the theorem itself is what's stated in this box here. It says if there's an equation, we have it involving k variables uh, that is dimensionally uh, homogeneous. It can be reduced to relationship among k minus r independent dimensions, or dimensionless products. Where r is the total number of dimensions that span the space we're talking about. So this means if we have, for example, um, if we have u1 is equal to a function of u2, u3, dot, 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 uk, then we have to pick from among our mass, length, time, and uh, we'll leave temperature out of it for now because we almost never use temperature. Uh, we have to pick from among these how many we need to describe all of the terms involved on both sides of the equation here. We don't know what the function is. We're just saying that we have some u1, some dependent variable, that we figure is a function of these. And uh, we'll, we'll get into the, these steps more later. But uh, then you write out each of these in terms of your mass, length, time, dimension system. Count up the total number of mass, length, time terms required. It's a maximum of three, right? You only have three things here. Uh, and 
the total number of these that you require to describe everything here, we call R. And so we have K terms up here, we have R of these required, and then by performing our, uh, our dimensional analysis, what we get is instead a relationship that looks like pi 1 is equal to some function of pi 2, pi 3, 2 pi, k minus r. And what's, this may seem kind of silly at first, but uh, what's really useful about this is that all these pi terms, remember, have no dimensions, so they're applicable in any unit system. And if we figure out a way to uh, keep these dimensionless terms uh, constant, if we're doing model testing, for example, then we learn something about, uh, they become more generally applicable. So that was something we cover more starting on Friday when we talk about model testing. Um, okay. So, for example, we're going to be figuring out how many, like what our values of k, what our values of r are for different relationships. Let's give that a couple practice runs. So if we're talking about a problem that involves drag as a function of area, length, and viscosity. So this is telling us is that uh, these function of L, U, this means we have one, two, three, four terms up here, right? <clears throat> telling us that K is equal to four. What are the dimensions of drag? Then? It's a force, right? Um, we can use, I should mention, we could use either, we could use either the mass length time scale or the force length time scale. They're going to give us the exact same um, result. It's just a question of sometimes a mass length time scale uh, is Quicker. Wait, why is K4 again? It should be 3. <coughs> K is 4 here because we have three independent variables and one dependent. Okay. Right? Don't forget about the guy on the left-hand side here. It's still a variable. Um, so, let's go ahead and use a, the force length time scale then. So this is just going to be F, right? Area. <coughs> Viscosity. <coughs> you remember this one? Remember the units we used to describe dynamic viscosity? It's usually something like uh, <coughs> second per meter squared. This is going to be force, time, length, to the negative 2. So if we look at all of these together, we've got force, we've got length, we have time. That means we've maxed out our three dimensions, right? So R is by definition 3, which tells us that by doing the pi analysis, or the, the, the dimensional analysis we're going to talk about today, we could instead turn this into a relationship of 4 minus 3, one variable, meaning we get one dimensionless variable equal to a constant, basically, which is uh, a lot easier than dealing with, for example, if you were to perform experiments, if you were simply to say, I have this dimensionless variable here is equal to a constant, Performing experiments to determine this constant is going to be a lot easier than performing experiments in a three-dimensional parametric space. Right? If you want ten values, well, all you need is one value here. It's a constant. Up here, in order to determine this relationship uniquely, you're going to need, who knows, uh, if you want ten, ten points in each direction, you're already talking about a thousand experiments. 
So, um, how about the second one? Okay, in this case. A is still equal to 4. Right? There's still four variables. It's nothing saying that length 1, length 2, length 3 have to be related to each other. Right? This could be the distance from Ann Arbor to Timbuktu, and this could be the distance across the room. Unrelated. Um, and if this is a dependent variable, then it counts. But all of these have units of width or dimensions of just length, right? So in this case, r is equal to only one, telling us that if we perform our dimensional analysis, we're only gonna reduce this relationship by one, uh, at one variable. So we're gonna end up with a function of three dimensionless variables. All right. So, um, the Buckingham Pi theorem, the thing that allows us to do this dimensional analysis, as I said, is sort of this cookbook formula involving eight steps, uh, which look like these, and we're going to go through these um, in detail in the next few slides with an example problem. Uh, but it generally, just to kind of get in your head, starts out by listing, by looking at the problem sort of brainstorming a list of all of the variables that you think are going to influence the problem, right? If you're saying the drag on a body, you need to look at it, have some sort of a physical intuition of what's going on in the problem so that you can at least take an educated guess at what is going to affect the drag. Uh, the next is to, just as we did over here, express uh, each of those variables in their mass length time, temperature, force length time, temperature uh, dimensions. Then you count up K, you count up R, and you figure out how many pi terms you're looking for. Pi terms are these dimensionless terms that we get out of the dimensional analysis. All right, then this is where things get a little bit trickier. Uh, well, not tricky, just, uh, <coughs> I should say, just less fluffy. Um, you pick what are called repeating variables, which is why this method is called the repeating variable method, um, which basically are any variables that cannot be uh, combined. For example, uh, these, these three here could be picked as repeating variables because this has force length squared, force time length negative two. There's no way you can take two of these and combine them in order to come up with the dimensions of that third, right? Both of these lack time. Put these together, uh, there's no way of getting rid of the time in here to get force. If you put these two together, there's no way of getting rid of the time to get length. So they're all independent from one another. And so that's the idea of repeating variables, is you need to select a number of repeating variables equal to the number of total dimensions that are independent they have to be able to fully describe the space. Have you guys uh, taken any linear algebra? Okay. Um, I just I, I always like to think of this as a, as a like a basis expansion it's called, um, but that's not important. Um, then you go through each of these repeating variables, or no, sorry, you take these repeating variables out of the problem. These are the pr the things that you're actually removing from r terms that you're removing from the functional relationship. And then you use these to get rid of the dimensions of everything that's left in the problem. Okay. So, uh, and then you just repeat and check that you didn't screw it up. So, um, let's take a look at uh, The, the sort of the problem that I was using to motivate this on Friday, uh, which is if we're looking at flow through a straight horizontal pipe, with diameter D, 
flow moving down here with velocity v. It has viscosity mu and density rho. And then uh, <clears throat> we'll go ahead and say that the remember the, the pressure drop per unit length of pipe. We're going to call that delta p sub l is pressure over length is equal to a function of uh, v mu rho v. Okay, this is this is the um, the the motivator from, from Friday. And remember, I said that the reason we we require dimensional analysis to look at this problem is as simple as this is. Even though there are no gravitational effects, we're assuming it's steady. We're assuming it's essentially one dimensional. Uh, the there's no analytical solution for this. Theory doesn't doesn't cut the mustard. Uh, we can't solve our Navier-Stokes equations to get our pressure drop out of this problem. So we have to get experimental data instead. And because we have four variables in here, uh, it becomes very very expensive to perform experiments in a dense enough way that we get meaningful data. So instead using dimensional analysis, we're going to try to reduce this to pi 1 equals some function of pi 2. So that instead of a four-dimensional space, we are able to plot all of the results that are going to affect this problem as just a line. Okay. So, for this problem, Uh, step one, we've already sort of done that, right? We've, um, a reviewing problem, I've said, here are the things we think are likely to affect the pressure drop in a pipe. So, part two now is we need to express each of these in terms of mass, length, time, dimensions. Uh, <clears throat> so, Greg, <coughs> Alright, so drag, um, drag oh sorry, sorry, diameter, my bad. That's what I get using D for two things. Thank you. Uh, uh, Matt, why don't you give me the, uh, do diameter, uh, Sam, density, uh, Christina, viscosity, and Caleb, uh, velocity. So we're using mass, length, <coughs> time. So diameter is just the length. Yeah. Length. Density. Mass or length cubed. Mass, length. Negative three. Viscosity. Um, works over. I don't remember the rest. Um. All right. So, um, I think that there's actually even, uh, does anyone have their book, their textbook on them? No? All right. I think that there's a table at the front of the book that lists uh, dimensions of common engineering units. Um, viscosity, uh, remember, we might use units of Newton second per meter squared. Um, we've, we've dropped the, the force as one of our uh, as one of our dimensions. Instead we're using mass. So um, so you're right, it's gonna be force, and then we're gonna have time. Oops, force, time, length to negative two, but we need to replace this force with something having to do with mass, which means that um, because force then has units or <laughs> dimensions of mass uh, length, time, and the negative two, making this substitution in here. Uh, it's going to get us. Ah, we'll just write it over here. 
mass length negative one time to the negative one. Okay, um, and then velocity. Yeah, length time negative one. All right. Uh, so, next step is determining the number of required pi terms, which means figuring out our values of k and our values of r. Um, k is going to be, what, let's go here, five. And then r is, okay, how many of our mass length time terms? So, of these three, how many are needed? are included if you look at all of this. Alright. Three. Okay. Do we not have to do pressure? Oh, good point. We didn't do pressure. Pressure. Um all right. So pressure is going to be, for example, units would be then uh, newtons per meter squared, right? Would be a Pascal. But we're talking about pressure per unit length. That is the reduction in pressure for each unit length of pipe. So we're going to cut out a. Uh, we're going to put another length dimension on the bottom. So this means we're going to have force on top. So meters, uh, or my, sorry, mass length times the negative two, and then we've got a length to negative three giving us mass, length, negative two, time to the negative two. Mass, length, negative two, time to the negative two. Okay, now we have all five of our terms. <coughs> okay, so we've got k, five, r equal to three, which means the required number of pi terms is going to be two. Okay. So, um, you know, I think that So this tells us we're looking for a relationship of something like pi 1 is equal to a function of pi 2, right? Pretty good considering that we know ahead of time that's what we're looking for. Um, what I should have done is I've written all this stuff up over here, I'm going to do that now. He did, this was done in a, well, we're going to do mass length time because I prefer that. Mass length, negative three. Mass length, negative one, times one. And, Okay, uh, so the next step is to pick what our repeating variables are going to be. Now, the rules for the repeating variables, I already told you one, which is that they have to be independent. Um, the other two rules are there have to be r of them, it's, uh, from our mass length time scale, whatever our value of r was. We have to pick that many repeating variables. And all of the <coughs> dimensions that are in involved in the problem have to be represented. So there are three things you have to keep in mind. One, your set of repeating variables has to have all the dimensions in the problem. They have to be independent, and there have to be R of them. So for this case, <coughs> uh, 
one repeating variable might be, it usually makes sense to pick ones that are simple, right? Ones that involve the fewest dimensions first, because those are the easiest to uh, keep uh, independent. So let's go ahead and pick diameter here as one. So we've got length. We need something that has mass, and we need something that has time, and they need to be independent from one another. So if we pick next uh, example row here, this is OK. We have mass. And because mass is in here and it's not in here, these two are independent. There's no way to get these dimensions by multiplying this um, or combining it with anything. And then let's go ahead and pick uh, velocity here because with length and time involved in here, combining these two won't get us anything with mass. Combining these two won't get rid of the mass. Combining these two won't get rid of the mass. You can see that they're independent. And then we have our mass, length, time contained within our three variables. Okay, so um, I think that these are actually the same ones that were picked, yeah, the example problem. Um, and so yeah, another way of another way of thinking about this is if you were able to write some uh, combination of your independent variables that doesn't have any dimensions, uh, then you have need to pick new or new repeating variables. Um, so then, yeah. So can you do one that doesn't work? One that doesn't work. Actually, from this problem, there aren't any that don't oh, work. Okay. Uh, but there will be cases where they don't. For example, uh, if you have something that's like. Um, like I said, if you have like <coughs> length equals, uh, let's say, uh, or let's say we have uh, some, I don't know, let's just take a variable. H is equal to a function of uh, a force, uh, a moment, and a distance, <coughs> and a mass, or, or sorry, and a uh, density. Right um, here, we could say, all right, I've got five k is equal to five um, with uh, got mass, length, and time. All right, so we're already going to have our three dimensions. So we're looking for we'd be looking for three repeating variables here. However, if you were to pick if you were to pick force, which has mass, um, length, time negative two, and you were to pick moment, which, had, which is mass, length, times the negative 2 times another length, and then you were to pick length. The problem is here, if you multiply this by this, you get the same dimensions as this, oh. right? So they're not independent. This means if you were to say FL over M, you have a dimensionless group. So that's not a valid choice. All right, so um, the idea with creating a pie term, and this is, this is the, the real, like, this is the working step, okay? Is you say, I now want to combine, you say, I want to pick the first of my non-repeating variables. So our repeating variables here are, uh, we've said that um, a function of diameter, row, viscosity, and Velocity, we picked as our repeating variables this guy, this guy, and this guy. Which means we've got two non-repeating variables. One, <coughs> two. So step five is the one that we iterate on. We perform this once for each of our non-repeating variables. So our first one's going to be our independent variable here, the pressure drop, create a length. And we want to use this to create a pi term. And the way we're going to do that is by multiplying it by some arbitrary combination of our repeating terms. So we write something like this, where we have pi 1 is equal to our non-repeating term times 
each of our re repeating terms raised to an arbitrary power. Okay. So the goal here is that uh, we now need to determine the values of a, b, and c. And we do that by recognizing that if this is dimensionless, and this has uh, dimensions of mass to the zero, length to the zero, time to the zero. So with this case, uh, what we're going to do is So, um, a, was it rho v to the v, okay. v, v, rho to the c. Alright, so the dimensions of this problem are going to be what? It should just be a matter of reading off stuff we've got over there. Uh, the pressure drop per unit length is going to be <coughs> what? Mass two times negative two. Diameter raised to the A is then going to be length to the A, right? Velocity raised to the B is then going to be length to B times the negative B. Rho to the C is then going to be mass C length negative three C. So we know this, so this, this pi term then is going to have dimensions of this. And now what we need to do is we need to say that mass of zero, length of zero times zero is equal to this guy. Which means let's consolidate our terms. So we have mass to the one, where else has mass? Here, plus c. Length to the negative 2, we have an A, we have a B, and we have a negative 3C. So length to negative 2 plus A plus B minus 3C. And time, we have a negative 2, we have a negative B. Negative 2 <coughs> minus B. So at this point, it just becomes a matter of solving a system of equations using each of these equal to zero. So for m, we have 1 plus c equal to zero, which tells us c must equal negative 1. Right? Let's go ahead and look at time next, because that's the next easiest. Time tells us that negative 2 minus b is equal to 0, which tells us that b has to be equal to negative 2. So now, we have two of them. Solving for the third here should be pretty easy. So length, we've got negative 2 plus a plus b, which is equal to negative 2. So this means a minus 2 minus 3c, which is negative 1, so that equals plus 3, which is equal to negative 2, minus 2, plus 3, negative 1 plus a equal to 0, which tells us then that a must equal to 1. So we now have all of our powers, so we can go ahead and write our pi term pi 1 is equal to then delta P L times D to the A, where times diameter, velocity to the B, B is negative 2, so we've got C squared, and rho to the C, C is negative 1, so we've got rho on the bottom here. So we have pressure drop unit length times diameter over rho b squared. I'm going to write that up over here. 
here. One. So, uh, we've actually already gone through this. Okay, so the next step, um, the next thing we need to do is repeat that for all our remaining or uh, non-repeating variables. We only had two non-repeating variables, delta P, L, and mu. So the next step is to repeat this process for mu. Um, mu has units of, or has dimensions of what? Up over there. So this is yes, this is gonna be pi two. Um, okay, let's count this up. Do our total consolidated uh, dimensions are you Exponents of m change? No. L? Yes, this changes to a negative one. This changes to a negative one. So now we just perform the same process. So again, all I did was plug in the dimensions of viscosity here, our dynamic viscosity, and then the corresponding dimensions of d, v, rho, uh, and consolidated them. And now we need to solve for a, b, and c such that this whole thing has is dimensionless. So uh, c here, we can see that this is still the solution for c actually. Uh, 1 plus c is going to be equal to 0. c is equal to negative 1 still. t, now we've got negative 1 minus b is equal to 0. So we've got b is equal to negative 1. And then for length, we've got negative 1 plus a plus b, which is equal to negative 1, minus 1, uh, minus 3c. So that equals a plus 3. Right, minus 1, minus 1, plus 3. A plus 1 equals 0, which tells us that A is equal to negative 1. So what this tells us now is that our second pi term, pi 2, is now equal to mu over rho. B, D. Uh, okay, now this is, I, I understand this all seems kind of, uh, it's very formulaic and a little bit boring, I kind of change your pace from what we were doing before, but I want you to understand what a powerful tool doing this actually is because um, we've, as I said, we've taken a problem that involved uh, a total of five variables. And, I, I, and I, I, I gave the motivation on Friday, but the idea is we have no idea what the relationship is here. We cannot get it from theory. All we can do is experiments. And so if we go into the lab and we want to test what the effect of changing the diameter is, we have to hold all of these constant, run experiments with varying diameters of pipe, measure the pressure drops. There we go. Let's say we want 10 experiments there, or 10 points. We get 10, uh, 10 experiments. But those are only good for these values of rho, u, uh, mu, v. And as a result, if we want to know the effect of changing diameter while changing, uh, while changing the, uh, the density, while changing viscosity, while changing velocity, we have to run 10 by 10 by 10 by 10 or 10,000 experiments. What we've done is just by looking at the problem without any detailed knowledge of the, what, you know, the, the math, just by performing this dimensional analysis, we've reduced this to something where we say um, the, the, the pressure drop coefficient, length, 
e over rho v squared is equal to some function of uh, our pi 2 term there, mu over rho v d. Meaning we can go into the lab now, we can pick <coughs> any pipe. We can, we, can, we can take pipe, we can vary its diameter, um, and instead of looking at the change, uh, the effect of changing the diameter, we're just looking at the effect of the change in this dimensionless term. So if we increase the diameter by a factor of 2, what that means is it's the same effect on the problem as decreasing the viscosity by a factor of 2. It's a function relationship between dimensionless terms. Uh, and this is really valuable because now if you want to say, all right, um, I have these results. You know, we, it, all of the results we could get simply follow, we can plot along the line instead of this four-dimensional space. Um, we can just plot this in a 2D graph, all right? Uh, so if you, if you say, all right, I want to know the effect of changing the diameter while holding this thing constant, then it's very simple to do. You simply uh, look up on your curve what the constant values of mu, rho, v are um, with, with whatever your chosen diameter is, or whatever the rate of change of this variable with diameter is, and look at the output and then scale by your known diameter and these guys and you get a pressure drop out. So it's a way of taking a problem and making it much more universal. Um, so uh, that was my quick aside right there, but uh, the last things we need to do now are check that, so we've so gotten through step six, um, the last couple things to do are just to check that the resulting pi terms are in fact dimensionless, which is the uh, the sanity check or the screw up check, right? And um, we'll spare you the details, but if we went through and we plugged in our dimensions for each of our pi terms, we would see that if we did this system of equations correctly, we do in fact get um, mass length time or force length time, whatever your dimension choice is, each raised to the zero. Okay, so this means our total, um, our final expression, our relationship among the pi terms can be written like this. The other important thing about uh, using these dimensionless terms is that it, we can manipulate them, right? We could say, I want to raise this entire thing to uh, the negative one, or turn it into this, okay? Um, let's make that a negative one. Uh, the reason we're allowed to do this is because we haven't changed anything that's inside of the function, right? If this is our function, phi instead of f, um, then manipulating the dimensionless variable inside of it hasn't changed that functional relationship. It's just changed, uh, you know, the, 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 the way we express the values inside. And why this is good, or why this is useful, is because now this we can recognize as a classic dimensionless term called the Reynolds number. I'm sure you've heard this term spouted out before, talking about um, whether it's talking about uh, ship holes or, or whatnot. But the Reynolds number is a way of expressing how important viscosity is in a problem. So the, the, the intuition here, or the takeaway, is that we see that the pressure drop proportional to some combination of diameter, density, and velocity squared is dependent only upon the Reynolds number. So, meaning if we get this relationship, if we perform experiments to get the Reynolds number dependence, um, then we can assess the pressure drop in any pipe. You can bring along any pipe with a known diameter, say it's fluid's gonna throw, flow through it this fast with a viscosity and density of these values. You calculate the Reynolds number, you look up on your chart what the drag coefficients, or the pressure drop coefficient is going to be, and you plug in your known values here, and you get the new pressure drop. So um, there are a couple of things that you want to be careful of when doing dimensional analysis, and I want to touch on these, and then we're going to do one more example. Um, so uh, the, the, the probably the... Uh, the hardest part of dimensional analysis is first picking what your 
variables are going into the problem. And the reason for this is it's very easy to pick every variable under the sun um, when many of them may not actually affect the problem. Uh, you could do worse things. Picking, picking a lot of unnecessary variables isn't going to mess up your dimensional analysis. What it's going to do is it's going to leave you with an, a lot of extra pi terms so that when you go into the lab to perform your experiments, you still have a lot of extra dimensions to explore. And remember that performing full factorial experiments, uh, it's a power law. If you're doing 10, 10 data points along each dimension, you have n dimensions, you need 10 to the n experiments to fully cover that space. Um, so this is where we have to look at the problem, kind of mull it over in our heads, and decide uh, intelligently what variables we think are actually going to come into play in a meaningful way. All right. Um, if I want to ask about, uh, if, if, if somebody was saying, you know, here's our, our dependent variable is the amount, uh, the number of, I don't know, neutrinos radiated from the sun that are hitting our bodies every second. And uh, somebody listed off as an independent variable uh, what direction Joe's hat is. Uh, it's, it, it might affect it to some very minimal degree, but it's not going to be a meaningful component of the problem. Right? So this is where our job as engineers comes in. We say, all right, I recognize that in a, in, in a very theoretical sense, something might come into a problem, but I'm not really worried about that, so let's leave it out to reduce the complexity of the problem. If we had thrown one extra, if there were one extra variable in here, for example, if we had included the temperature of the, um, well, temperature is not a good example. If we had included the, uh, I don't know, maybe the, the roughness of the pipe, right, is a, is a variable in here, we uh, would have ended up with one more pi term, which means that now, uh, in that case, our final relationship would involve a two-dimensional relationship where we need the Reynolds number and we need something having to do with the pipe roughness, um, which means that instead of 10 data points, we would need 100. Um, so that, that, that was built up very quickly. Um, so one way to kind of think of this that is useful is to, to, to break down the problem. You say, look, most problems, at least in the fluids, are described by three general categories of variables. Those are geometric, these are any of the lengths, the angles, the distances um, that are required to describe the, uh, the, the features of interest. So for the pipe, as I said, diameter, yeah, we care about the diameter, we may choose to leave out the roughness. Those would both be geometric variables, okay? Material properties. Uh, this is the way some, you know, the fluid or the solid in the system reacts to something that's acting on it. This includes viscosity, this includes density, uh, Young's modulus if you're talking about a solid. And then finally, external effects are anything that are creating change in the system, like pressures, velocities, forces, moments, things that are acting on your system. So it's helpful to kind of step through each of these three categories, say, all right, what is important here and list them down. <clears throat> then go through your total, your final list of uh, variables. Say, is there anything here I can neglect? I can leave out with reasonable engineering accuracy. And the last thing is, are there any terms that don't fit into uh, one of these three categories? Can anyone think of a variable that doesn't fit well into one of these three categories? I told you your problem was unsteady. How about time? Right. Time's the big one, actually. You just got to be cognizant that um, systems aren't always going to be steady, and so sometimes you need to include time as a variable directly. Time obviously doesn't fit. It's not geometric or material property or an external effect. So. Be careful. Uh, all right, the next consideration that's important is that our, our variables that go into the problem also all have to be independent from one another. Okay. 
Um, now, the, the independence of, of these variables um, is a little bit different than the independence I was talking about with our repeating terms here. Uh, independence here signifies that there's no function that allows us to compute one of these variables from the other ones. For example, um, a very, well, a very good example is um, if I want, if I, if I have a problem that depends on viscosity and density. We have two different kinds of viscosity, right? There's dynamic and there's kinematic. Um, where we have dynamic and kinematic viscosity, but the way they're related is that the kinematic viscosity is equal to dynamic viscosity divided by density. So if we wanted to include all three of these, we would have a problem because there's only two real independent variables there. Any two of them allow us to compute the third. So if, some, if you were to list all three of these in your functional relationship, you need to go back during your check and say, hold on, I spot that two of these are not independent and you need to cut one of them out. Alternatively, um, th this could also work to your advantage. For example, if, uh, if you're talking about a problem that involves, let's say, uh, a function <coughs> of, um, let's say, a function of density, of viscosity, of velocity, um, length, width, height, and uh, volume, right? If you have some, if this is some simple geometric shape, let's say you've got, it's just a box that we're talking about here, if our length, width, and height. Um, then what this means is length, width, height, and volume, these are not all independent, right? Because volume is just the product of these three. But length, width, and height only enter the problem through the volume. Like, this is the only term that actually includes any dependence on the length, width, or height. And so what we can do is instead of saying, well, let's cut one of these out, you know, length, width, volume, those are independent, but um, we could say that uh, instead we could cut all three of these out and just keep the volume instead. We can consolidate our terms so we end up with a smaller relationship. Okay, so to summarize, we did just it. We say, step one, define the problem, think about it carefully, figure out what physics are important, and write down the variables that you think come into play. Number two, um, okay, yeah, then, uh, yeah, part two is, is sorry, consider the physics. Um, which really depends on you having at least a, uh, a basic physical intuition about what's going on. You don't need to know the math behind it. That's why we do dimensional analysis, is we don't know the math behind stuff. Um, three is that a categorically good way of starting is to look at your geometric, your material property, and your uh, external effects in turn, and list down all the variable, list out all the variables that may fall into those categories, then consider any variables that do not fall into those categories at the end, for example, time. Um, it's important here to remember that variables don't have to actually be changes, you know, things that change. For example, gravity is a good example. Uh, don't leave out gravity from a problem if it affects it just because it's a constant. We're interested in any parameter of physics that affects, you know, the, uh, the solution. The solution, and then uh, finally, make sure that they're all independent. Look for any functional relationships uh, among different subsets of the variables. So this sounds like a long list of things to keep in your head. All right? It, it, it's 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 like do this, but check this, 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 and this, and then do that, but make sure the step one doesn't do this, that, that. It's it's kind of a pain, but. I think you'll find that as you start going through and doing dimensional analyses, uh, a lot of this is much more intuitive than it sounds right now. So don't worry about um, keeping these all 
in your head all the time. Uh, so let's do one more nice simple example here. Uh, this is one that I like a lot because it's very easy, really. Um, so take a moment and perform step one of the dimensional analysis. That is, list out all the variables you think come into play in the problem, which is how far has a body fallen? fallen? Uh, it's an arbitrary body with length L, um, height H, we'll say it has density rho, um, gravity is acting downward, it's falling in a vacuum. Okay, so assume, assume that air is not present. Um, and our, our dependent variable here is y, the distance fallen from its initial condition. Start, uh, start listing up variables. So, y is a function of what? Sorry, Joe, you want to grow up Gravity. Okay, um, now let's take a good hard look at these variables we picked out. Uh, we could go ahead and list velocity if we want. Okay. Um, Let's take a good hard look at this problem, though, as I said. Um, we're going to concentrate on this constraint. That's sort of what I'm, that's, 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 that's what we're working our way towards. Is, uh, we, we've probably seen the, the, you know, as grade schoolers, the science fair demonstration, right, that, that the weight of an object does not affect how fast it falls. Fast falls. Feather falls as quickly as a bowling ball in vacuum. So this tells us that length, h, and rho actually are not important. Right? If there's no air resistance to account for, if we're talking if we're talking about something that has wind resistance, then this is not true. Okay. But um, 
So this is a case where we'd use our engineering sense and we'd say if something is sufficiently close to a vacuum, if we're talking about something that's entering the upper reaches of Earth's atmosphere where we have very rarefied gas, uh, we might say this is sufficiently close to a vacuum that we can ignore the dimensions and the density of the object. Um, all right, uh, now if we have then, the only thing causing this to accelerate is gravity then, right? This is the only force, gravitational weight, which means that our acceleration is going to be constant, yeah? So let's look at whether our remaining terms, our g, t, and v, are actually independent. Um, if we have a constant acceleration, or constant acceleration, how do we compute the velocity? It's just going to be velocity is equal to gt, right? If it's starting from zero, starting from rest. So we have a relationship here between gt and v, which means that we need to cut one of these out because we don't have three uh, independent terms. So let's go ahead and just for the sake of it, um, we'll say we'll, we'll, we'll get rid of velocity for now, which leaves us with y is a function of g t, okay? So this tells us then that k is equal to, we have one, two, three terms, three terms. Step two then is to express each of these in terms of our mass, length, time, dimensions, yeah? So y has dimensions then of what? Uh, just length. Let's go. G, dimensions of and Time big surprise dimensions of t. So how many total dimensions do we have represented? Right. R equals two, which means that we're looking for three minus two, one pi term. Um, so three. We'll just say. K minus R equals one pi term. Okay, now let's pick our uh, our repeating variables for this problem. Um, I don't want to pick it. Pick pick two of these. Then we need two repeating variables, and they have to be independent. Y and T. Huh? It can be any of them. Yeah. Our choice is fairly arbitrary here. Um, y and T uh, are a good choice because they're both fairly simple, right? Each of them only involve one dimension, which is one here. Uh, another fairly uh, reasonable choice could be G and T because you could say, um, some people like to try to leave the dependent variable as the non-repeating. That is, they try to not dimensionalize the dependent variable. But it doesn't really matter. Okay. So, um, step four here then is to pick. We've got y equals function of g. We picked this guy and this guy. By the way, the implication here is that we can say um, that G is also a uh, a function of Y and T, right? We're saying the re the functional relationship here goes both ways. So step five is to determine our pi term. So this means that if g is our non-repeating variable, we have g times y to the a times to the b, which has dimensions of mass, uh, sorry, mass is not in this problem. 
uh, has dimensions of length times the negative 2 length to the a time to the b which is equal to we're seeking length 0 times the 0 All right. so for length this gives us 1 plus a plus 0 time this gives us negative 2 plus b So this implies here that a is equal to negative 1. This implies that b is equal to 2, which gives us our pi term g uh, over y t squared. And uh, so now, if we write out our, our functional relationship, um, let me go ahead and uh, kill that for a moment. Sorry for jumping around, but I'm going to move step six. Well, step six is um, to repeat this for all uh, non repeating variables, of which we only have one. So step six is not applicable here. All right, step seven then is to uh, check that all of our terms are actually dimensionless, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, check our pi terms. So we have g t squared over y, which has dimensions of, uh, I keep writing mass length, times negative 2, time 2, length negative 1. We can see by inspection, lengths cancel, times cancel, equals length to 0, time 0. All right, so this is, in fact, dimensionless. All right, now our last step is to write out our functional relationship and sort of consider what does it mean. Look at our implications. So because we only have one pi term, we have pi 1 is equal to some unknown function of nothing. And if something doesn't have, doesn't depend on any other variables, that means it is by definition a constant, right? This tells us that pi 1 is equal to g t squared over y is equal to constant. Hmm? Why is it nothing? Why is it nothing? Well, because we only have one pi term. There's no other, there are no other variables. We used y and t to non-dimensionalize g, so there are no other variables left in the problem. Okay, so when we write out that, we, we, we determined up here, we only have one pi term. Um, so if we had a second pi term, we'd just go in the parentheses. If we had, if we had, yeah, if we had a second pi term, I would go in here, but, um, there are no there are no other pi terms to, to have as a functional input. Um, so uh, what I want to do here is is just uh, say all right. Um, so what this means is if this is a constant, how many like, we we'd only need one experiment then to determine what this constant relationship is. So if we go into the lab and we pump the air out of a out of a tube and we drop some object, we know what g is, we time it, we measure how far it fell, we get y and t, what we're going to end up with is that this is equal to a constant of 2. Which means, now, that if we're looking for our original relationship, we can say, let's flip both sides of this. So we have y over g t squared is equal to 1 half. We could re-manipulate this and say y is equal to 1 half g t squared. All right. This is the same thing you get from integration. Uh, I think uh, somebody said that this, you know, that the exact same thing that 
that Isaac Newton came up with, but we didn't have to invent calculus to get it. Okay. We did this fairly easy process of uh, dimensional analysis and just manipulating dimensions. So, uh, show of hands if you understood this, this, this example. All right. Fantastic. Um, and uh, we'll be doing an example later. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to this when we get into the model testing. Um, because I want you guys to understand just how like near and dear dimensional analysis is the naval architect. This is, I, I mentioned this on Friday, this is exactly why we still have jobs. Okay? Uh, because ship models are valuable because we can perform a dimensional analysis and show that for example, the, the, the resistance on a ship hull right, is a function of, we can say, the drag coefficient, which is a pi term, the drag non-dimensionalized by some other parts of the problem, are functions of the refrude number, another pi term, and the Reynolds number, another pi term. Okay. And then there's this thing called Froude's hypothesis, which says, all right, we can... We can take apart the, we can strip these two parts of the problems apart. He makes some assumption about the functional relationship, and that allows us to do model testing uh, and model correlation to determine shift resistance. All right. Um, so just a, a few uh, kind of notes to finish this up. Um, I want to go back to our example of the, the the pipe flow problem, just to demonstrate something. Um, Remember that we, we picked uh, our repeating variables, and this goes back to your question, Joe, about whether we, any of our repeating variable choices would work. Um, we picked uh, D, V, and rho, right? Diameter, velocity, density is our repeating variables. But what if we had picked instead diameter, velocity, density? Well, if we carried this part of the problem through, what we'd find is that we end up with our, uh, our new, our, our pi terms would come out a little bit different. Okay. But if you note, the pi term on this side would simply be a product of the pi term inside of here multiplied by our original pi term. So um, the idea here is that our pi terms are never unique sets. All that the dimensional analysis says is that you will have, for example, with a pipe flow problem, it tells us you will absolutely have two pi terms. They will be dimensionless, um, and we can uh, determine. And those pi terms are then, you know, fairly arbitrary. Uh, for example, here, or for example, here we say we have uh, two pi terms. We can multiply those pi terms together arbitrarily, and what we still have is a valid relationship. Okay. Uh, As I mentioned before, um, if there's only one pi variable uh, that exists, then that means, or if we only have one pi term, that means it has to be a constant. So we can pick the, determine that constant from running just as many experiments as it requires to get a good, um, good confidence in that we figured out what that constant is. If we have two pi terms, this means that we have uh, some relationship that can be expressed as plot, right, in, in 2D space. We have our first pi term, our second pi term, and we just perform experiments. Uh, the important thing here is that we need to make sure that we perform experiments over a large enough range that whatever our range of interest for the problem is, is inside of that. Uh, for example, you don't want to only perform experiments over Reynolds numbers in this range and then just assume that whatever curve you fit through that is valid out here. Um, that would get you into trouble. If you have three pi terms, it could be thought of as a series of curves, right? Or as a surface. It could be thought as a two-dimensional or three-dimensional three surface plot. Um, and so this kind of demonstrates that as, as more, as you become, get more and more pi terms, just like as the problem gets more and more independent variables, uh, your experiments are going to get more and more complicated and harder to uh, uh, interpret. 
So, uh, anyway, um, that wraps up what we're covering today. Um, remember, Wednesday is going to be uh, midterm number two. So, it's not going to be a lecture. The plan is I'm going to hand out the exam in class, the beginning of class. You'll have the class time to work on it. However, if you're feeling rushed for time in class, you have the chance to take it home with you, work on it, and turn it in, and turn it in at the beginning of class on Friday. So the point here is just you have that structured in class time if you're somebody that likes to work on the exams in class. And uh, if you finish it in class, by all means, turn it in. But if you're someone who doesn't like to be under the gun to finish an exam, by all means, take it home. Uh, I'm going to be designing the exam to be about an hour and a half, so it's not like it's going to be a, a killer that you're going to have to take home. Um, you have the handwritten formula sheet from last time, plus one more, or if you want to rewrite two entirely new uh, single-sided sheets, go for it. And here the honor code applies. Well, if you take the exam home, please do not assume that that means you're allowed to consult your book, your notes, and your friends. Uh, the honor code is applying here. Uh, and finally, it's not designed to be a cumulative exam. We're covering chapters 4 through 6 primarily, but chapters 4 through 6 have built on a lot of the knowledge from chapters 1 through 3. So don't think that you just get to forget everything that we covered before. I'm not going to be testing exclusively or like, like specifically on any of that material, but uh, you should be comfortable with it. So, um, all right, let's, uh, that wraps up today. Um, as I said, we've got an hour in the Rosenblatt room. Um, for you to ask questions about the review problems. So let's plan a move meeting over there in about 10 minutes or so. Really? Yeah, so yeah. Is there a curve in your class? Is there what? Is there a curve in your class? There are going to be a curve. There is a curve. I have not yet determined the curve. We don't have the grade yet. But, uh, but yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm like right on the border of two grades.
I like the most. Because um, I have two lab labs.